My name's Isaiah Rivera. I have a 50.5 inch vertical, which is an official world record. And today I'm gonna to be answering your questions about jumping higher. The first question that I got asked is, how am I so light and lean, but so strong for my body weight? Typically, if you wanna get stronger, you gotta get heavier, right? You see, same thing with bodybuilders, right? You gotta eat a ton so that you can put on more muscle mass and you get stronger, same with power lifters. The bigger you can get, the more weight that you can push, that is called absolute strength. But I have really high levels of relative strength, which is basically how strong you are for your body weight. And relative strength is what is most important for jumping higher. So how exactly did I get so strong? If you don't know, my body weight ranges from about 181 on the low end to 184 on the high end. And my numbers are 500 pound half squat, uh, deep squat. My best ever was 405. I'm stronger now. I just don't deep back squat anymore. It's probably somewhere in the, in the low to mid 400s. I have a deep front squat of 385. I power clean 315 pounds. And my deadlift is 500 pounds, which is something I don't train. So I was able to do that without training and I could probably go higher. Uh, so those are our numbers, really high numbers. And I also do this at under 10% body fat and I am six foot two with really long limbs. A lot of times I'll put what my numbers are at my body weight and an athlete will say, oh, I can lift the same amount as you at the same body weight, but I don't jump as high as you. Then I go look at their page and they're, you know, 5'9", 5'10", with really short limbs. Something that plays a huge role when it comes to jumping is torque. Torque is force times distance. The, and when you have really long limbs and you're able to apply the same force as an athlete with shorter limbs, you're able to apply more torque. And torque is what is important to jumping higher. That's why long-limbed athletes are generally, that are strong, generally jump so high. If you look at some of the strongest professional dunkers, right, you have a T flying high, Jay Clark the Jumper, me, Jordan Kilgannon. We all have relatively long limbs for our heights and a very high strength level. Um, so that's kind of like where those differences are. But how exactly does that happen? Because I've, I've been lifting now for about 10 years consistently, training really hard in the weight room, and I've gained relatively low body weight. So first we have to see how body weight gain occurs, right? And that is by taking in more calories, or taking in less calories, expending more calories out than you take in. Uh, being at a caloric surplus is what allows you to gain weight. So just using logic there, if you train super, super hard, right? You can lift as hard as humanly possible. If you eat at a maintenance level where, where uh, the calories out is the same as calories in, you are not gonna gain any body weight and you'll still be able to get stronger. Uh, the other thing that's really important is protein, right? Your muscles gain strength, right? When you, when you lift a weight, your muscles break down, right? The proteins break down, and then you need to take in those substrates so that your body has the fuel and tools necessary to build that up. Protein is literally what your muscle uses to, to build muscle. So, right, we're, we're getting some pieces together here. So we have training, increases strength. Uh, you have to eat at a maintenance level. Um, and then you have to take in enough protein. If you do those things, you'll be able to get stronger uh, without gaining a ton of weight. Now, being at a caloric surplus is very beneficial for putting on muscle and also having the energy levels. If you're losing weight while training really hard, your training quality is gonna decrease a ton and then the incidence of injury is also going to increase, which is why I always uh, tell athletes to eat at a slight caloric surplus and the amount of body weight that you gain is going to be offset by the amount of strength that you're gaining. Basically, you're going to get stronger at a faster rate than you're going to increase your body weight. And as long as it's specific muscle mass, uh, it's going to help you. It's going to help you jump higher 
as long as you're also doing more specific work later on, right? So you can, as long as you put muscles on your quads, calves, hamstrings, your butt, the muscles that are the prime movers when you jump, and then you do more specific work later on, right? You're jumping a lot, you're working in those specific muscle ranges, you're lifting very intensely later on in the year, right? Doing one to three reps, uh, you're doing explosive strength work, plyometrics, you're gonna be able to actualize those hypertrophy gains into vertical jump gains. And I think there is a misconception when an athlete, somebody that doesn't know who I am, they'll go look at my Instagram page and they're like, whoa, how did he stay so light and get so strong? But they actually don't see that. Yes, I'm light and I'm lean, but I'm actually way bigger than when I started training. So if you look at me when I was 17, 18 years old, I was in the high 150s, low 160s. I've gained 20 to 30 pounds of lean muscle mass since I started training. You can see the bit, a big difference if you look at my legs now compared to my legs earlier. So there are benefits, and I recommend to be at a caloric surplus as long as you stay lean. If you're above 10% body fat, um, I would prioritize getting lean, finding out what your maintenance calories are, and then learn. basically put yourself conducive to max strength and less to hypertrophy. Research shows that lifting in that 6 to 12 rep range is going to be best for hypertrophy. Uh, so if you're not trying to put on muscle, which again, it's not, it's not a super horrible thing if it's specific muscle mass, but if that's not what you're trying to do. If you lift in those lower rep ranges, you're going to get a lot of max strength gains just from neurally becoming a more efficient athlete, a more, a more powerful athlete. Um, you're also going to increase the size of those uh, type two muscle fibers, fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, hypertrophy there is also going to allow you to become, to gain relative strength. So hopefully that answered your question pretty well. Next question. What are the differences between training one and two foot jumps? Essentially, we train them the same. It's just that certain cycles are going to be more specific, right? So if you just look at the differences in a, in a one versus two foot jump. A one foot jump is gonna use more of your posterior chain, going to use uh, smaller ranges of motion in the leg it's gonna, and then it's going to have lower ground contact times. So when you're choosing exercises to train one versus two foot jump, the ones that are lower ground contact time, that use more, more posterior chain uh, and that use smaller ranges of motion are going to transfer over to a one foot jump more than a two foot jump. But we still want to do you still want to surf the entire force velocity curve for variety so that you can continue adapting and then to hit the general work so that you don't get hurt and then you also increase your potential to actualize the gains from the more specific training stimuli that you're going to be applying later on in the training year. So we train them generally the same. It's just certain cycles are going to be more specific and the sessions, of course, the most important part is that you're practicing your one foot jumps. Law of specificity. If you want to get better at something, do it more. And you need to be one foot jumping frequently if you want to increase your vertical off one foot. Um, next one. Why do most pro dunkers have a big difference between their standing and running verticals? Specificity, right? They just practice running verticals way more than standing verticals. That's going to have a bigger gap in there. If you're not practicing your standing vert, that's going to lower or not improve. And if you're practicing your running approach, that's going to improve. And eventually the difference is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Two, they've, uh, they've done so many, rep so many repetitions of approach jumps that their approach is dialed in. It's going to be way more efficient. They're going to be way better at converting that horizontal momentum into vertical velocity. Um, their neural system is going to be way more efficient and wired and... That, that motor pattern is going to be way more grooved in there. Um, and then finally, the whole point of an approach is just to increase. You're basically going to be loading up your muscles even more. That way you can stretch them more and become more elastic and have more of a return on energy. Uh, use muscle stretch, reflex, all that stuff to be able to convert all that momentum and energy that's built up and all that force and direct it upwards. So that's why we jump so much higher off of an approach. 
how often do you do approach jumps in your training? Is there ever a point when you aren't? I do approach jumps at least once a week and there is never a period of time where I'm not doing approach jumps unless I'm hurt. That's the only caveat. Aside from that, it is the most important thing that you need to be doing at least once a week. Never go more than a week. If you're healthy, never go more than a week without doing approach jumps. It is extremely important, literally the most important thing. And then this is kind of a lead in into a later question. For a beginner, what should the jump frequency and volume be? If you are a beginner, if you have a low training age when it comes to jumping, this could mean you're 12 years old or it could mean that you are 30 years old and never practiced jumping. You should be jumping as frequently as you can as long as you don't get hurt. So jumping, jump training specifically, is literally a fine line between injury and adaptation. You wanna get as close to injury as possible without actually crossing the line. Um, and the closer you can get to that, the more progress you're going to make. Um, the thing is, is it's hard to stay disciplined and stay under that line. But yeah, jump literally as frequently as you can. Um, and then in order to avoid injury, just gradually build that up. So don't just start jumping every single day for three hours a day. Start with one session a week, 10 minutes. Gradually increase the time of each session um, until, you know, you're jumping for an hour or two and not getting hurt. Then you can add another session for 10 minutes and basically go from there. If you are training super hard though, I would advise against doing this uh, for too long. I only advise that for guys that have a very low training age um, because you want to get your approach dialed in as, as quickly as possible and um, get the gains from that as early as possible. But if you've been training for a while um, and your training is pretty complex, I, I would warn against doing more than two sessions per week because it can be very difficult to not get hurt at that point. Is there any ideal ratio for body weight to one rep max for squat, clean, and deadlift? So I gave my ratios earlier. Don't number chase. Always just get even stronger. There is a lot of numbers out there floating around. Like, for example, get to a 1.5 times body weight squat before you start doing plyometrics. Um, or get to a 2x times body weight squat and then stop focusing on strength training. You're strong enough, just, there's other things that you can do. In our experience at THP, we're freaking trying to break through plateaus. And to do that, you need to get stronger. And if you're already strong, get even stronger. We're gonna cover all the bases as we surf the force velocity curve. But when it's time to train and, it's, and you're trying to do a cycle where you're doing max strength, get even stronger. Don't care about ratios. Don't compare yourself to other people. Just get stronger. Always. It's always. I've never seen it not help as long as you're also doing power work, last work, explosive strength, plyometrics, jumping frequently. As long as you're covering all those bases, getting stronger always helps. Next, if I feel knee pain, should I rest? No, rest is the worst thing that you can do for tendons. Resting is literally worse for your tendons than overtraining your tendons are. Um, so at minimum, you should find a way to load your knees where you feel better the next day. If you ask yourself that question, it'll set you on the right path and you will get healthy eventually. But do not rest the knee. That is the worst thing that you can do. If I am trying to peak in two months, how should I train? That is literally what periodization is. Periodization is planning training so that you can have your best performance at a specific period of time. If I had, and then this question is kind of complex to answer because to answer it, you have to also ask, what have you been doing for the last year, right? You have to do a needs analysis. A needs analysis is basically questions you should ask an athlete to see where they're at. So a needs analysis, first you ask, do you have any injuries? What injuries are you currently dealing with? What are your strength numbers at? How much have you been jumping, right? You ask yourself all that stuff, and then you ask, all right, when do you need to jump high? And then based on those questions, that's when we make a plan. So that's actually one of the benefits of having our coaching is when you sign up for our coaching, you go to a group call 
And hey, if you have a basketball tournament, a volleyball tournament in a month, and it's on a weekend, last two days, you tell us, boom, we're gonna peak you right for it. But the short answer for that, you wanna load for a month, the second month, do a cycle that's more specific, and then back off hard for the week before uh, whatever it is that you're trying to peak for um, is gonna happen, and you'll be good to go. But if you want us to do that for you, go to thpstrength.com, and we will help you out with that. All right. And then the last question, how long should a hypertrophy cycle last for a beginner? Generally, every single training cycle that we program is going to be about a month. Anything longer than that, and you're going to have negative side effects of accommodation start to come in. And you're not going to be able to take full advantage of variety. Variety is a very, very potent uh, training law that you need. And if you apply it correctly, you can make long-term progress for a long, long, long time. So generally, for whether you're a beginner, an immediate athlete, advanced athlete, um, we're going to be doing cycles of about a month just to have variety. So that is it for the Q&A. If you enjoyed that, like the video. If you are listening to this on any of the podcast platforms, please leave a five-star rating. And like always, if you want me to coach you to jump higher, go to thpstrength.com. And I will see you on the other side. Thanks for watching, everybody.